Ned, you're a philosopher of mind, uh, been so, very well known. Uh, uh, how important is uh, neuroscience in informing philosophy, not just philosophy of mind, but in general? Uh, I think certainly it's really important in philosophy, of, in, in philosophy of mind. A little bit, some importance in other areas of philosophy, too. Uh, I give Pat Churchland a lot of credit. She coined the term neurophilosophy. I think, you know, the way I used to do philosophy of mind before I got into neuroscience was I thought of fantastic, um, you know, fantasy examples. Um, what I learned when I started learning some neuroscience is that actually the truth is so much weirder than anything I could ever have imagined. <laughs> Um, and, you know, the, the mind stretchingness of the, uh, of the, what you find out in neuroscience is really quite useful for philosophy. Mm. So, w one example is the, uh, uh, the case of the two different visual systems. I don't think any philosopher would ever have guessed that we have two different, completely different visual systems. One unconscious system that is faster than the conscious system, has no memory, um, and is mainly action oriented. Mm. That's the so-called dorsal system at the top of the head. And then there is the slow, deliberate, um, conscious ventral system that is mainly usable, use, useful for planning. Mm. Um, and uh, You can see the evolutionary benefits of both of those. You can see the evolutionary benefits, but it also reflects something about the way the mind evolved, which mm. is by adding on. Mm. So it appears that um, the... What evolution did in creating us is it took some simpler organism and then added some other mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. to it. So, uh, um, the, uh, you know, for some animals are mainly, their visual system is mainly that dorsal system, like dogs, for example. Mm -hmm. They have very little of that conscious ventral system. Dogs mm -hmm. are very poor at the kind of recognition mm -hmm. um, and color vision that we have in that ventral, mm -hmm. ventral system. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it added our, the visual areas are just add-on reproduced retinas. There are all these re so-called retinotopic areas. They're evolutionarily speaking, they're, the evolution just added another retina to get a more complex visual system. And the peculiarities of the visual system reflect it. I think if you don't understand that about the design of the mind, you're never going to get anywhere in, in, in thinking about the philosophical issues. But when you do that, can you get into what some have called neuromania? Yes. Where you think that now you will solve all the deep philosophical yes. problems, even about philosophy of mind, and uh, by, by, by uh, as, as some would say, surrendering to neuroscience. Yes, I, I do think there is such a thing as neuromania. And, 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 and although I, I admire Pat Churchland for inventing neurophilosophy, she has succumbed to neuromania. She <laughs> thinks you can solve all the standard philosophical problems by neuroscience, you know, free will versus determinism. And, you know, I, I don't think it does that. So that's neuromania. But, you know, if you're just conservative about it and, you know, use... Um, it used um, neuroscience in a, in, a, in a moderate, reasonable way. I think it can be very helpful. Where can you get in trouble? Get in trouble by, by trying to solve all the big problems of philosophy using neuroscience. I think what you can solve, I think the problem of consciousness is maybe one big problem. But the That's others in a maybe, separate category. It's a separate I mean, category. I mean, there, but the others are, can be enlivened and uh, you know certain nuances can be can be uh, brought to be neuroscience can be brought to bear on those but I don't think they're just going to solve the problems yeah free will is a good example I think. yeah because uh, in free will there are neuroscience a lot of neuroscience experiments but the question yeah. is you know are, are they really addressing the, the deep issues of free will and determinism yeah. and indeterminism yeah, are they think, addressing those at I don't all? think they are okay. no no, I think those issues remain and are mainly philosophical issues. You know, I take the view that many philosophers take that um, the concepts of free will and determinism that we are using in understanding this issue are often confused concepts. So they're, they're, or at least the concept of free will. Um, so that free will is both compatible and incompatible with determinism. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. That's a whole other topic. And yeah. so, so basically, you, you are, call yourself a neurophilosopher, but you, you stop short of going into neuromania. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.